Hi, welcome to Tabs Two Cents. Today on the show, we have Shabam Garg. He's the president and CEO of White Tundra Investments, and we're talking oil and gas today. I really learned a lot in this podcast, so I hope you enjoy the show as well. Welcome to Tabs Two Cents, the show where we discuss multiple income streams and macro factors affecting the world today. Hey, Shabam. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. I thought we could just start out with a little introduction, kind of what you like to focus on, what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, you bet. So uh, my background academically is uh, through petroleum engineering. Uh, I studied at the University of Alberta, uh, graduated 2018 uh, with the co-op program. And uh, basically what I did uh, is I did the co-op program. So I worked about 20 months in the field, uh, different parts of Saskatchewan and Alberta. So all the way from sort of Southeast Saskatchewan in the Weyburn CO2 field is where I started. Uh, did, a, did a small four month engineering gig um, out of Drake Valley, Central Alberta, and then uh, did, did some unconventional gas. And then and then sort of in the Montney in Grand Prairie with, with another private producer. And uh, my whole goal throughout the process was as I'm doing my studies, I really wanted to get exposed to all sorts of sizes of companies all the different plays. So you have your sort of your heavy oil, your uh, your gas play, your your liquids rich unconventionals that are coming up in the Canadian oil space. So so I really want to target that and and did that for for those 20 months. I graduated in 2018. I launched um, White Tundra Resources as a sort of a consulting engineering plus field operations firm. Um, did that. Uh, operated wells in just South Lloyd Minster for about a year. And I just loved the whole concept that if I'm going to be doing engineering and production optimization on wells, I, I just wanted to operate the wells as well. I wanted to be out there, see how the wells responded in real time, see how things were going and, and really get an understanding um, rather than, you know, sit in an office and make decisions. Um, so did that for about a year. And then an opportunity came up to go back up to Grand Prairie, which is kind of the big activity hub right now with the Montney zone. Uh, some of the Duvernay work as well is done from that area. Big growth areas with the invention of sort of horizontal drilling and uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. So went back up there and um, I, I basically had about 40 wells. I had a couple of compressor stations. Um, an oil battery and did the same thing, but but with sort of more responsibility this time, I was not only operating wells, but I was sort of on call 24 seven, making decisions from field level. And then I would work from the Calgary office few days a month to liaise uh, with the Calgary engineers, the, the management team and sort of be that uh, middleman, if you will, as to sort of what's going on. Uh, so did that until about March of 2021. Um, that was all through White Tundra Resources. And in the meantime, I have been investing in oil and gas equities since 2013, since I started college. And obviously not good years all the way till, till about 2019. Uh, we saw a little bit of a shift in the market at that point. And then we got slammed with COVID. And all these equities just absolutely got, got whacked. But at that time, uh, I decided to go all in. Basically, I was borrowing money. I was I was maximizing everything I could to invest in oil and gas equities with the with the long term thesis uh, on them, uh, which we can get into here later on. Um, and then things worked out to a point where I sort of left the oil patch, uh, the the field based stuff, anyways. Uh, March 2021, went traveling for a bit, uh, sort of kept investing. I sort of was looking for okay, where do I want to take this? Later on in 2021, launched uh, White Tundra Investments. So. Kind of a few things that I do through through White Tundra. I have a private fund that I run. It's investing sort of in a concentrated uh, portfolio. We have one or two positions that make up 50% or higher of the portfolio. Um, sort of a, a very steady but but high potential equities with strong ownership. Another 30 to 40% of the fund goes into cash flowing, high growth, sort of stable equities as well, but that have really really strong potential but they also can go both ways depending on the oil price. And then about 10% of the portfolio is, is given to very small junior up and coming plays that have very strong management teams. They have something that differentiates them from the rest of the industry, uh, whether it's a new technology, they have a, some sort of unique play uh, and operation style that's a little bit different, um, et cetera. So that's sort of the, the main focus of it. In addition to that, I run a weekly seminar so we go through evaluations on three or four companies every week. 
uh, based on an eight times free cash flow model, which is what I believe these equities will get back to when, when the cycle sort of as a cycle matures. Uh, so we do that. I discuss insights on each of the companies based on sort of the latest well results, their development plans, mapping things out, their acreage maps, their reserves, the quality of their management and sort of other factors with the company that are not obvious. I'm strictly looking at corporate presentations, if you will. And I talk to management teams, try and share as much insight as I can uh, on them. Through that, I have a, a price targets spreadsheet on my website where all these companies, based on the models that get calculated at different WTI and different ACO pricing levels, uh, there's a price targets spreadsheet, which is sort of an easy way for new investors to go and say, okay, these companies are offering the, the highest upside, but they have this much risk, or they have lower upside, but they are also uh, a low debt equity or, or whatever sort of they're looking for in their investment uh, style. You know, with that, just sort of want to really get people more comfortable with the oil and gas industry. This is an industry that's extremely opaque. It's extremely hard to understand. It's very volatile. And a lot of people just are not comfortable with even wanting to look into it. So just getting people more comfortable with that, sharing as much information as I can. And uh, there's some more coming up here shortly with some sort of data visualization dashboards and other graphing software, uh, comparing well results across peers and companies. So lots more on the way and uh, look forward to kind of sharing that as things uh, go along here. That's a great background and obviously a lot of knowledge in the oil and gas industry then. I've kind of come into oil and gas naturally as I'm a Canadian and, you know, there's obviously a lot of work going on up here, but what brought me into the space, interestingly enough, was carbon credits. And what happened was I started looking into carbon credits. I started looking into the energy transition and what I started to realize was that oil and gas is here to stay for a very long time. And regardless of the transition, you're going to need something to power that movement. So I think that kind of plays into the macro outlook and the long-term vision that you mentioned earlier. I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about how you see oil and gas moving forward. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Uh, probably the most important thing, um, you know, on top of mind. So the way the thesis kind of is, is it revolves around when we look at oil in the past, it's, it's been this cyclical nature. Every five years, the price of oil goes up and then stays there for five years and then it comes down for five years, we have sort of this boom bust cycle that many, many people are just used to. Um, they don't maybe notice it in their day-to-day -day lives, but it's just how it's been. And what's happened is that after 2014, the cycle got sort of screwed up. And what happened was we have conventional oil and then we have shale oil. Conventional oil being sort of long lead projects. So you put the money in today, the oil doesn't come online for three to five years one does come online, it's a steady production cycle. So, so it stays at that rate for you know, 10, 15, 20 years at a very low decline rate. And what happened was we had these, these short cycle American shale come on the, on the scene in about 2013, 2014. And what shale is, it's very, very fast production. So if I put the money in the ground today, I can get a barrel of oil out in like three months or even less possibly. But the problem is shale oil declines. So if I get 100 barrels today, by the end of one year, so 12 months, it's going to be maybe 25 or 30 barrels. So a high, high decline rate on it. And what happened was people were tripping over themselves since 2014. The industry got overcapitalized. They were being paid on production growth, not making any money, but they kept drilling because they were getting paid on production growth. So they kept drilling. There was too much supply of oil whenever the price looked like it was going to go back up, they just started drilling more and brought more supply online. And in the meantime, the conventional oil projects never got capitalized. So these projects that were sort of dripping production every year as they came online. So think about your OPEC oil, your Russian oil, some of your Canadian oil sands, which is not really conventional, but it falls under this, the same production regime. All these projects, some of the offshore stuff, it never got capitalized. And we were beginning to enter a cycle in late 2019, where we saw the end of shale growth, not the end of shale, but the end of shale growth, shale adding one to 2 million barrels a year. It was, it was really slowing down. And in the meantime, world demand just kept picking up. 
despite all the narratives of, of EVs and renewables, and we're going to kill the industry and oil's never going above $12 again and, and all this stuff, um, demand just kept picking up from emerging markets, from the Indias of the world, the Vietnams, the uh, Nigeria, some of the South American countries, even OPEC countries, demand just kept picking up. So we were at this point where the market was getting into balance and we had a line of sight to an undersupplied market. And then COVID hit. What we saw was a massive demand shock. And at the same time, supply as well got hit because nobody wants to produce oil at $20, $25 a barrel. So coming out of that, what ended up happening was demand got back way faster than supply did. And we started drawing inventories, inventories being our savings account. So we had crude and products and gasoline and diesel all over the world. And we just started drawing these uh, products one by one, day by day, week by week, month by month. And we were definitely in an undersupplied market. And the theory was, okay, there's no conventional projects coming online. Shale is unable to add production and nobody really wants to spend money on increasing production. So we're going to stay in this undersupplied market until we hit a level that either producers want to invest again in oil or you have demand destruction to the point where the market gets brought back into this balanced sort of regime, which the thesis is, is a lot higher than where we are today. To kind of elaborate on that a little bit, from 2010 to 14, when we were in this sort of undersupplied oil market, a lot of producers were taking on a lot of debt. They would go and, and really start drilling. They wanted to bring projects online. They wanted to capitalize the market. And the whole mandate was how much production can we grow? It was not about making money or paying dividends or doing share buybacks. It was how much production can we grow? That has completely shifted from that cycle to this cycle. We're now in a cycle here where we've been above $90 a barrel, call it roughly, for almost nine months now, you can say. And we're not seeing production growth, not from shale, not from Canadian producers, not from OPEC, not from offshore. No projects worldwide are getting sanctioned. So where is the supply going to come from? And that's really where the thesis uh, begins. A lot of people thought, oh, as soon as the prices got higher, companies would just invest more and we would have a very short cycle of higher prices. And it's not really looking to be the case. There's, there's no investment happening. We remain in this undersupplied market. We have sort of band-aided the problem with absolutely massive uh, strategic petroleum reserve releases out of the US and other countries as well around the world. And we had China slow down massively this year. They had a large portion of their economy shut down for greater than six months of this year, right after the Olympics happened. So those two band-aids have really hewed the, the reality of the market and what's coming on the horizon. And that's where we sit today. We sit here with the market sort of in balance, slightly undersupplied, China reopening, adding maybe up to 2 million barrels a day of oil demand. We see Russian production falling off, their exports falling off. We see the world itself opening. We saw news out of Australia. We knew, saw news out of uh, Macau, out of Canada, that they're going to reopen to sort of a, a fully reopening status, which is just more oil demand. This is despite talk of a, of a recession. This is despite the US GDP printing negative for two quarters in a row, probably going to end up for three quarters in a row or more. And with interest rates rising, the oil supply demand has just not changed because any demand that's coming down in the, in the developed markets is just growing in emerging markets. So you end up in a place where we're going to remain under supply for a long, long time. We've drained our inventories. Nobody wants to increase production until we get to higher pricing. And even if they do increase production, that production doesn't come online for three to five years, setting us up for this sort of bullish cycle which uh, oil and gas investors are, are looking towards here as the months go on, as we go into 2023, as the USSPR drains to a low level, as China reopens, and then as the Russian barrels start to drop off the market. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great way of summarizing all of those major world events that have happened lately, because it's been quite the whirlwind. You know, when I've maybe been looking at this for, you know, four or five years as opposed to as, as long as you have, but just over that time, it's been such a wild ride and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around what's going on with the supply and demand dynamics. And I know, as you mentioned earlier, it's kind of an opaque industry. It's sort of hard for people to understand. I wonder if you could just discuss a little bit about the 
grades of oil because I, I always struggle with that. I know, I know Canada's heavy oil, and but then the Saudis, they have their lighter blends that seem to be easier to process. And Because uh, what I've heard is that the Canadian heavy oil to produce that oil is actually more emission heavy. So that, that could hurt them moving forward if people are looking for a greener oil, let's say. Yeah, definitely great point. So I think the two sort of main oil blends that are traded in the market would be your, your WTI, so your West Texas Intermediate Oil. It's traded out of Cushing, Oklahoma. It's, it's becoming a greater and greater benchmark, especially as American production has seen this resurgence. It's a lighter oil, mostly used for creating gasoline. And then you mentioned the WCS blend, which is the Canadian heavy blend. So your Western Canadian select. There's two places of trades that I'm aware of. One is at Houston, Texas, and then one is in Hardesty, Alberta. Different pricing depending on where it's being sold because there's a transportation cost associated with, with getting the oil from Alberta to Houston, Texas. And rightfully so, as you mentioned, this, this is a high emission, a high carbon, heavier barrel. It's used for more of your, your diesels, your jet fuels, your, your asphalts, uh, residual fuel oils, et cetera. And if we focus just on North America for a second, the issue that's happened is although the WTI blend is a more valuable barrel per se, it trades at a higher price, the American refineries are not set up to process WTI light oil. A lot of the refining in America is set up to process this heavier barrel because they knew they were going to have this heavy oil source for the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. So they said, okay, if we're going to set up our refinery a certain way, let's set it up to produce this heavy barrel because we know we can have it for the next X amount of decades. And then light oil came on the scene. It's not easy to just move a refinery to start processing light oil. It's, it's not how it works. It needs hundreds of millions of dollars, a lot of maintenance a lot of changeovers and companies just are not willing to do that work when they have the cheaper heavy barrel available to process. So what ends up happening is a lot of the American shale oil is getting exported off to other countries, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's India, Europe, China, et cetera. So that's the North American market, how it functions. The, the other blend of oil that's, that's quite important is the Brent oil. This is a European creative oil. It's out of the North Sea which used to be big, big offshore production. It's declined here over the last few years, but it's still one of the most traded grades of oil. It sets the benchmark for, for a lot of the even lighter grades of oil uh, out there. And then you have your OPEC blends. So you have your Saudi blends, you have your Kuwaiti blends, uh, Iraqi, uh, Iranian blends, all sort of similar grades. The same grade will have a light, medium, and heavy, all priced differently. And the way they're priced is off of Brent uh, or off of WTI. I think it's mostly Brent. So every month, these countries will go and say, we're going to price our oil at Brent plus $4 or Brent minus $3. And that's the going price for that month, which is adjusted monthly. The OPEC prices are actually quite important because they set the price for about 40 million barrels a day of production. So almost half of the world's, call it 100 million barrels a day, of, of oil and liquids production is set based on the, the Saudi blend, really. And this all goes in a world market. People are doing all sorts of arbitrage. They say, okay, if I can buy a barrel here, I can ship it to this place for $2, but the same oil here is trading for $5 above this blend. So I can make $3 a barrel by shipping it here, shipping it there. And this is done daily. This is not just somebody makes a decision and goes with it. These prices adjust daily. There's millions and millions of dollars to be made. Uh, there are traders making hundreds of millions of dollars of money for their companies by just buying oil and selling oil at the right places. And that's really what the market is. Now, when we talk about the Canadian barrel, naturally a heavier barrel means it's a higher carbon chain molecule. So it's going to be a higher a carbon barrel to begin with. It's going to be harder to extract because it's heavier. It doesn't flow as easily. So you have to use some heating methods. You have to use some separation methods. You have to do a lot of refining to it to, to really get it to the grades you want. That's just the way that oil works. If there's a heavier barrel, it's going to be harder to process because it doesn't want to flow. It's got all sorts of impurities in it. It's got sulfur in it. It's got asphaltines, uh, tannins, I believe they call them. And 
other sort of issues with this oil, but it's still a very, very valuable barrel, especially because what's happened over the last few years is, is the heavy barrel production has gone down in the world and we see more light oil production, but the world still consumes you know, the, the same ratio of diesel to gasoline, to asphalt, to residual oils, et cetera. So as production declined in Venezuela, in Mexico, in some of the North, like heavy European grades, some of the OPEC countries, you're seeing the WCS barrel is actually getting more and more hard to find. And there might come a time in the future where you might see refiners go and fight for these heavy barrels because there's no real other source out there. I got to give the Canadian industry credit for my time working there. There's been a lot of work done to really work on carbon emissions. The industry realizes they have a target on their back, not just from environmentalists, not just from the governments, but even from a market standpoint, there's more and more companies that are saying, what are your carbon carbon emissions on your barrel? If it's too high, we're not going to buy it. And there's producers that are saying, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by X amount of percentage by this year. It doesn't really matter whether you or I agree with it, whether we think it's it's correct or wrong. It, it just is what it is. And when we look at the market that way, a lot of the producers have done a lot of work at really reducing the emissions associated with these barrels. They're moving to SAG D, a development instead of open pit mining. There's a lot of more refining done right on site. So you're not shipping these barrels all over the place and just other technologies that are coming out. I've never worked in the oil sands, so I don't, I can't say I know them specifically, but if you look at a lot of the work being done, the most money being spent on reducing emissions on getting sites back how they were before drilling, et cetera, is being done by the oil companies <laughs> and they just don't get credit for it. No matter what they do, they just get penalized and maybe, you know, they should work on marketing these things a little bit better and need a little bit more government support around that uh, as well as time goes on. Yeah, I completely agree. I think for me, sort of an outlook that I've taken on carbon in general, and it's not necessarily oil and gas. I just kind of ended up there because Canada has to be one of the most regulated oil and gas industries in the world, especially when it comes to emissions. And as you say, like it or not, this is the way the world's moving. And there could come a time when companies, you know, with all the net zero pledges and scope one to three and all these kind of promises that they're making, they may have to move into Canadian oil because it could end up being one of the cleanest barrels and you can't be buying, you know, dirty Venezuelan oil, for example, with loose regulations and then claiming to be net zero because people, you know, especially the way ESG is moving, it's getting more of a microscope on it. People might call them out on that. So, you know, I think for me, the overall thesis would be that because Canada is such a heavily regulated industry, they could have the cleanest oil moving forward. And I find it interesting that in oil, they don't grade these barrels like they do hydrogen. For example, so you've got, you know, green hydrogen, which is created with you know, renewable energy or whatever, but oil doesn't do that. Why do you, why do you think that is? And do you think that could be coming? Yeah, certainly. I've, I've seen it in some places where there's, there is these net zero barrels. I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but I saw it in, in one of the corporate presentations that I'm not even exactly sure how, how, or what makes it a net zero barrel, but I think there's a lot of work being done around sort of CO2 injection and okay, if we're going to produce this, we're also sequestering this much carbon to, to offset these things uh, around that. And I think the reason it's not here yet is just because people need the oil. Like right now it's, it's not really a big deal per se. Like there's not so many different sources of oil out there that you can really be that picky over things. Um, and also I think people just realize that that oil itself is, is such a carbon intensive thing to begin with uh, that it's, it's just really hard to make these barrels be out of renewable power. Like when we look at the scale of some of these, these operations, you're running trucks and, and, and mine equipment that is just unfathomable. Like you, you go to some of these oil sands mines or, or SAG D projects, and it's impossible to even like understand the scale of these operations. You see trucks that are the size of big buildings uh, roaming around site. It's, it's very hard to convert these things into renewables or runoff electricity because it would run for like five minutes and then you'd have to recharge it. So, you know, the, the industry around battery technology 
and other renewables is, is just not there yet. So just by nature of it, it's a highly extractive process. You're, you're drilling deep in the ground. Uh, there is being work done, I know, on the conve uh, unconventional side where let's say you're fracking fleets, instead of running on diesel oil, now they're running on natural gas, which saves a ton of emissions. It saves a ton of using liquids fuels to pump water down hole, which like doesn't even make sense when you think about it from an economic standpoint. Um, so, so it's great that the industry is doing these things. It just takes time for things to happen, especially because the capital cost on some of these things is so high. Like if you wanted to convert your, your frack fleet from, from diesel to natural gas, I mean, who's paying for it, right? You, you either have to, as a service company, pay for it and use that as a marketing tool, or you make some sort of long-term deal with the producer that says, okay, we'll convert it. You're going to save this much money and you have to keep this, this, this fleet running for two to three to five years. And that's how you're see, seeing these things happen because the industry just is not just on the producer side, they're just not putting money into the ground right now. They, they'd rather just run whatever's out there, pay back their debt entirely and pay some money to shareholders through dividends, share buybacks, get them back on their side. And then they can think about, okay, where do we move from here onwards? So, you know, let's not forget, the industry has been absolutely crippled since 2014. There hasn't even been enough money to do maintenance in a lot of cases. You're seeing rigs just get thrown out because they've been sitting in a yard somewhere for, for two years. And, um, you know, you're in Ontario, you know how the winter gets and you leave steel sitting outside for, for two winters from minus 40 to then plus 30 to then minus 40. Uh, it just doesn't like, like that sort of uh, cycling. So now that the industry has some money, I think there's going to be more and more focus towards these things. And uh, eventually it's going to depend on the market. If the market comes and says, we'll pay you $10 a barrel extra for a net zero barrel or for a barrel that was created using XYZ technique, the producers will do it, but the market isn't there yet. They're not, they're not paying them any extra. They're not uh, giving them credit for what's happened so far. So if that's the case, when we look at it, strictly economically, why would somebody do it? Uh, and, and that's sort of where we are now. We see some government support coming to certain parts of the industry. And when you see that happen, all of a sudden there's a mad rush to go and, and do these projects because they're, they're either more economical or they just make more sense uh, from a relative basis. So if somebody's paying you to do things running on, on this sort of power and they're subsidizing half the cost, well, now it, it may become relatively cheaper to, to do things that way than to just keep running things how you were using diesel or, or oil or um, whatever other car carbon source uh, way of doing things. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it's hard to comprehend the size of these operations if you haven't actually been on the ground, as you say. And it's a really good point because one of the other factors that brought me into oil and gas for carbon which is, I know, an interesting mix for some people. But a lot of these systems, the way they're set up with their cap and trade is based on industrial averages. So, you know, you, if you're an oil and gas company, you're going to have a relatively high amount of credits to work with before you start going over your cap. And I think what could happen moving forward is that as they progress, they start to find new technologies and ways to reduce carbon faster. Like, for example, I know you mentioned how horizontal drilling and, and new fracking techniques are coming in and all of a sudden your operation doesn't take as long and you're lower than the industrial average on there, you're going to have a surplus of credits. And this may be something that comes into effect later because I know also um, Marin Katusa, if you've lo looked at any of his work, he, he was talking about the impact that green bonds could have on the mining industry. And, you know, if a, if a company can get to the ESG rating that suffices these bonds, they can get cheaper funding to progress forward. And I think that could happen in oil and gas as well, as they, you know, decarbonize their industry, find some new technology, um, they could have access to this cheaper funding. Because I like to look at Canadian oil as sort of like the F1 racing of the energy world. It's it's highly regulated. They they really have to dig deep to find the technology to survive. And that's why it's been so difficult lately. So uh, what do you think about that? How's the technology moving in your opinion? Yeah, to your point, I think on the on the green bonds, we are already seeing that there's companies like Tamarack Valley that are making sustainable linked bonds, I believe, where they get this interest rate 
if their ESG metrics are X, Y, Z, and then if they don't meet them, then the interest rate goes higher by 2% or, or uh, whatever it is. So you already are seeing these things coming in. Uh, my only pushback to that would be the companies are not really getting credit for these things. Like if we think of it as that's the only way for the company to access debt, okay, I agree with, with that sort of uh, analogy, but if we're saying that the company doing these things is going to reflect in their share prices or equities, I don't think that's the case quite yet. And maybe that's what it might take for, for some of these companies to really get aggressive on these things is if they see share price appreciation, if they see investors who are, who are ESG plus commodity focused coming into the space and, and investing in these companies, that might be justification to go out and, and do some of these things. Um, as far as the the technologies. There's a lot of work already being done. Uh, the, the thing I would say with that from my time working in the industry is it's just a tough industry to go out and, and create new technologies in because it takes so much time. It takes so much effort. A lot of companies are not willing to sacrifice uh, runtime for you to go and, and, and try some new thing and then it doesn't work and they lose production for a week or a month especially with them being public companies, they're, they're sort of taking on a risk here, uh, which then you're putting economics against the environmental ESG basically bang on. And, and what's going to win? In a lot of cases, economics is going to win. That's just the way the markets work, um, especially with how these companies have been beat up. I think they're going to wait a while. They want to make some money first, pay off their debts so that they're not liable to any banks or any, any institutions, et cetera. And then they can look at, okay, what are we going to do here as the future goes on? So I think time is one thing that's going to help uh, with these technologies. You just give it enough time. Uh, there is things getting funded. I can say for sure, if we look at something like Advantage Energy and their entropy system, what they do is they take carbon off uh, the, the, the stacks on their compressor stations on the power generation equipment. It has about seven or 10% carbon, I believe. They've got this proprietary solvent that scrubs the carbon out and then they inject it down into the ground. So very, very solidly backed technologies. They just finished their phase one, uh, I believe on the glacier gas plants. So there is stuff coming into the pipeline uh, slowly. Um, there's there's other technologies like, for example, there's a company I invest in, Prospera Energy. They have partnered up with a clean tech startup, I would say, that goes and it can high grade this oil. So they'll go out, they'll get this heavy barrel, they'll refine it or they'll upgrade it right on site so that by the time that barrel gets to where it needs to, you're not just shipping this like heavy barrel that has to be diluted. And then on the other side, you got to get the diluent out, send it back here and there. Like a lot of the redundancies in the system are, are, are being worked on. And the technologies that are really coming out that I see are going to be your, your CO2 injection technologies. So the, the nature of the industry is, is such that you can't just say, we're going to get to zero emissions. It's not how it works um, in a commodity environment. So, so what companies are doing, they have to have X amount of emissions to run their, their, their systems. Then they go out and they sequester X amount of carbon in the ground. And therefore, when you, when you bring it to an overall company perspective, it becomes a net zero or a, or a company that's, that's negative, a negative emitter uh, with the way the credits work and, and all that. So that's, I think, where more of the industry is going towards. We're seeing a lot of carbon trunk lines being made, uh, a lot of carbon being, being taken from these stacks, pipeline somewhere, and then injected in the ground, whether it's for permanent storage or for CO2 flooding, which would be your enhanced oil recovery technique. Uh, which is also gaining a lot of popularity with, with various fields at this point that are under trial or very, very close to it. Um, so, so that's where I see the technologies heading. As far as reducing exact emissions, we see the low-hanging fruit being worked on right now. So uh, for example, when I used to work in Grand Prairie with modern, uh, modern resources, a lot of our chemical pumps used to run on solar. So it's a very low pull it, it's something that's cheap. You don't need millions of panels all over the place. You set up the site to be a, a ultra low emission site is what we call them. Our, our chemical pumps used to run on solar. Some of our equipment, like your um, actuators, uh, your, your dump valves, et cetera, would be all electric. So we're definitely working on the low hanging fruit part of things. We've seen electric compression now. Uh, 
uh, come into the, the foray. So I think the industry just needs time. It needs a higher price for longer, which seems to be where we're headed. And, and then they can focus on, okay, how can we decarbonize? How can we get these carbon credits and uh, use them well? We can possibly, there's a big first mover advantage, as you mentioned. You know, if you're the first mover, you're being compared to the industry standard, you get all these extra credits that you can sell for 60, 70, $80 a ton on the market to other producers. And that's an extra source of revenue right there. So I think the answer to your question is just time. The industry is very, very technologically advanced. There, there's a lot of people that have, have patents, they have lots of ideas, that they have lots of uh, technologies they want to try out. And unfortunately, in a 60 to $70 oil price environment, they get laughed out of their manager's office because you don't even have money to run your operations, let alone go out and, and do all these fancy trials. Uh, but, but in a higher for longer environment, I think even the general public, if they care to pay attention, will be shocked at how much at how, how much and how fast the industry adapts to, to some of these um, uh, higher carbon pricing regimes that we seem to be headed towards, um, basically in the near future and, and even as we speak. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And what I've learned so far from you is that the oil and gas industry doesn't move fast. And it's something that I found interesting. And it, what's nice about that is you can play oil and gas as oil and as carbon as time goes on, because I think as you're saying, you know, we're in a supply deficit right now and it's a good place to be in my opinion as well. So as you wait for the carbon tailwinds to move in and for those industries to adapt, you're going to reap the benefits of higher oil most likely. And what, what I found interesting was everybody was talking about the chip shortage and how impactful that was going to be on the automakers and how how much it was going to hurt Apple. And then on the other hand, you've got leaders up there like Biden telling the oil and gas industry to drill more and get to work. But what about their resources? You know, that's, it never comes up. Well, how are they going to get the steel? You know, it's, it's all of the supply, all of the supply, you know, dynamics are out the window at the moment. So it's not like they can just go and pump as much as they want. They're struggling too, just like everybody else. Yeah, hundred percent. And maybe that's one of the bullish thesis uh, accelerants uh, this time around, where even if you wanted to drill, you you can't find the, let alone the steel and the parts and the chips and the engines, et cetera, like you mentioned. I mean, we're, we have a big labor and expertise problem where a lot of uh, highly skilled engineers and geologists are unable to be found. And then you have a, a raw labor problem. The I believe it was the Canadian Drilling Association or something. They just put out a news news yesterday saying they can't even find sort of your, your, your bottom, I don't want to call them bottom barrel, but your, your very basic labor personnel. And when you do find them, they'll miss interviews, they'll work for a week, and then they'll say, oh, this is just, I mean, this is not what we expected. We can't be doing this uh, sort of work. And they just leave. Um, you got to train them. We saw ExxonMobil had a news release, not a news release, but a, but a news article put out on them. They're having lots of issues with on-site incidents because the industry is just so dangerous, you can't just pluck guys out of the street and, and, and throw them there without the right management and the right uh, mentorship, the right people watching over them, making sure they're not in the line of fire, they're not putting their uh, equipment where it shouldn't be. Um, that's, again, that's just the nature of the industry. So I think you're, you're bang on. The, uh, the shortage is real. And even if the chip shortage solves itself, the oil country tubular goods shortage is big time. The drilling rig shortage, the frack fleet shortage, and along with the labor shortage is just so major. You're not going to solve it overnight. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's an accelerant to the bullish thesis where we, even if we wanted to bring supply online, you can't just throw money at the problem. And you mentioned Biden. This, when he came into office, he said he's going to put the oil companies out of business. And now you're out there begging and pleading for them to increase production uh, and saying the gas stations need to reduce price and all this when they literally have no clue as to how the industry works and the timelines around it. You can't just, I can't just go to a company and say, oh, you must add five rigs today and, and I need oil in, in seven days. That's, it's not, this is not a video game where you can fast forward things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a real world. And I think some of the politicians and some of the general public have forgotten how difficult the real world is. 
compared to building softwares and apps and and all this uh, other online stuff. So I think a, a dose of reality may may not hurt, uh, to be honest, as uh, as bad as it would be for sort of people suffering from high inflation, high energy prices. I I I think the industry just there's nothing you can do about it at this point. We've we've cornered ourselves into this this situation. And it needs the right amount of time to get out of it. Um, and like you mentioned, uh, to your other point, uh, within the White Tundra portfolio, I think I've, I've set up my portfolio exactly as you mentioned. There's names in there that are exposed, not just oil, but to this carbon. Names that I think can either recover more oil using carbon uh, enhanced oil recovery schemes. There's names that are on the cutting edge of technology that I think can be sold to other companies. Uh, names that are really, really doing a lot of research in into creating new technologies. And if if something like that hits, I mean, you have something that can change the industry uh, in a very quick period of time. So I'm not going to say that a majority of my portfolio is in stuff like that, but having enough exposure to carbon, especially carbon enhanced oil recovery, is I believe very imperative going forward. You you set yourself up to be a double whammy. Uh, win-win situation if if the price of oil keeps going up and then you get not only carbon credits but you get possibly increased production from from this carbon schemes that are now economic after eight years of of, of sitting on the shelf uh, ready to go absolutely and I think even further to that companies that are unable to do that now they might be buying up carbon offset projects or different other ways to offset their carbon. And they could become net sellers in the future, not just from operations, but from their offset projects as well. I know Shell has done a lot of work with with things like that, and they have their own net zero obligations that they put out, scope one to three, which you know, for an oil and gas company, that's a huge endeavor to try to work out your scope three emissions. And it, it's interesting you said that about labor because... I think this could be something that's overlooked. I have, I've got friends, you know, being a Canadian who left Ontario, went out to Alberta, got trained up, you know, were roughnecks. Some of them worked up to push and one guy was a consultant. He started his own truck, suck truck company. None of them are in Alberta anymore. They all left in around 2014. They're all doing different things. Their roots are set and there is no way they're going to go back to being a roughneck working 12 shifts in a row. So uh, like, I'm not sure how they're going to find the manpower for these projects. It's going to come down, I think, like most things do, to pay and money. And it's going to have to be lucrative enough to pull people from the jobs they have to go into work into this hard, dangerous industry, as you say. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of still on the fence on this whole thing because I, I see pay that's being offered uh, where... I think if people realize that it's not just an hourly pay, you will be working like 250 to 350 hours a month and you run your hourly rate plus overtime, plus your LOA living allowance and all that, you're making money that is like unthinkable, even for a lot of engineers, let's say young petroleum engineers or even other sorts of engineers, you will get to those sorts of pay numbers after 10, 15, 20 years of experience. And you can go and make that right now uh, people are begging and pleading for you. There's going to be sustained work uh, based on the market, how it looks going forward uh, for at least the next three to five to possibly up to 10 years. And I just see people saying, you know what, like, why would I leave my remote work cushy job where I can, you know, sit around all day in my home or whatever, um, working off a laptop. And now I got to go there and, and be outside in the winter and deal with muddy roads and drive trucks and all this. Like, why would I do this, right? It's So two things that you mentioned are, are very important. One, the people that know how to do this work are just gone. They, they're not going to come back because they have their roots set. They have families, they got kids, they got other stuff they're doing where they're making lots of money. They don't really care uh, to come back. And then B, the generation now that I think is is in that same position where they could have left Ontario, they could leave the East Coast to go into the industry. The amount of people that are willing to do that is significantly lower. And it was already lower pre-COVID. I think after COVID, it's just become almost impossible to convince somebody to go and do these sorts of jobs um, in the amounts of people that we require. Sure, you can fill in you know, X percentage of, of the required labor, but you can't do a pipeline project unless you have 
all 5,000 people on site, the welders, the pipe fitters, the uh, construction equipment um, uh, drivers, the uh, lease construction people, you have your foremen, your, your camp people, et cetera. Like the system doesn't work unless the entire the entirety of the labor and, and skilled personnel and, and engineers, et cetera, are available to be found. So um, that's basically where we sit today. And, and let's not forget, it's not just the oil industry that needs these people. We're talking about some major, major potash projects, copper mines, gold mines, uh, lithium projects domestically within North America that are already FID'd, finalist, uh, final investment decision made, or are very close to it. So what do these industries have in common? Welders, pipe fitters, laborers, uh, scaffolders, et cetera. It's all common, uh, common personnel that you need. So um, how, how much money can we afford to throw at it? And does that even solve the problem? I, I'm not 100% sure that it, that it will because uh, at some point people just don't care. They, they're happy with the money they're making and the lifestyle they have. They don't, they don't want to change it. Um, especially something as unknown as the oil industry. You know, people literally have no idea how, how things work out there. They, they don't even know the difference between a drilling rig and a pump jack and, and everything else, right? So um, how many people are willing to, to take that plunge? Um, not, not all that many, in my opinion. I'm not sure what, what you're seeing with your, maybe your, your, some of your younger buddies or people who are in that same position, if they're interested, at, uh, even at higher pace. Not really. No, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm kind of, you know, I'm sort of mid thirties. I'm kind of moving into a nice rooted life. I probably would not do that regardless of the money, like you say. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's interesting when people go to school, they say, what are you going to take? You know, are you going to be an engineer? You want to be an accountant? Nobody says, do you want to go work in the oil and gas industry? Maybe you should look into that unless you live in Calgary or, or Texas or, or whatever, one of these, these major cities or states and i think that that could have something to do with the general perception from the public of oil and gas and that it's dying and and they could think why would i spend four years of my life studying for a degree in this field when the industry is going to die and as you and i both believe that it's not that's not the general perception i don't think so it's going to be hard and i think you made a really good point that i hadn't considered was that you need a full staff to complete these projects you can't just have people coming in and out no bad workers you got to have everybody ready to go to complete these projects so you know i think it's a you know, it's a tailwind for the price, I suppose. It's somewhat of a headwind for companies, perhaps, as far as growth, not necessarily paying off debt. But um, what do you see as sort of a catalyst that can get us into either higher or lower oil prices? Because I've been keeping a close eye on China. It's getting kind of pretty weird over there with, you know, rumors of Xi Jinping being arrested and stuff like that. And, you know, they're, they're sort of opening and then they're not. It's so hard to know what's going on with China. And then, of course, there's the war going on. And then on top of that, we have elections or midterms in the US and the SPR releases. What do you think is probably one one part of this entire macro picture that we should be looking at? Yeah, certainly. I think the most important is definitely China. I think yeah. the, the market and the pricing, a lot of people who have claimed victory over oil prices uh, falling, etc. this year so far, uh, have totally failed to mention that, that one of the biggest uh, oil consumers in the world uh, after America is, well, the biggest oil consumer in the world after America uh, by far is, um, has had a, a, a lot of their economy, not just locked down, but weirdly locked down. Like some of the pictures coming out of these guys in suits and there's an earthquake happening and they, they've locked the fire doors in and all sorts of strange uh, happenings that make no sense. Uh, this after they spent two years claiming there was no COVID uh, within China, they were reporting like three cases and zero cases uh, for for that long. It's just it's just unknown. But the the interesting thing that I think is a lot of this information we don't even need to really look for it. There's there's one factor that's going to tell you exactly how a country is doing, and it's something that cannot be faked. It's something that's real which is the number of flights operating in a country. If you look at any country and the number of flights operating in it any day, you will get an idea exactly, A, how their economy is doing, and B, what their COVID level is at that exact time. So 
And there's plenty of websites that, that do this for free, not just by country, but you can do it by airport. You can look at certain routings, like, like flights that go from US to China, for example. You can look at how many flights go every single day. As soon as I wake up, it's, it's one of the biggest things I check, certain routings, certain airports, and you get a really good idea of what's happening in these countries. And so when I, when I sort of started looking at this, maybe the, the Shanghai lockdowns happened, uh, Shanghai plus Beijing. And then early September, we saw Shenzhen and uh, Chengdu lockdown. And you start, sort of started to wonder what's gonna happen here. They, they obviously don't want to report poor GDP numbers again. We have the party Congress coming up October 16th. So they want the economy to be good. They don't wanna be having 200 million people who are stuck in their homes without food going into that. So there was a general consensus that either they were going to open right away, or this is just going to drag on for another six months to 12 months. And what I find really interesting is it's like people have been lulled into a sense of just thinking this is just going to continue on forever. But when you really think about it, it's it's just not feasible. That's that's not how this economy runs. They, they have to open up uh, despite all you're going to tell me, or not you, but despite all that people say about, oh, their culture is this and that. I mean, you just cannot keep people locked down like that in today's day and age. So an interesting thing started happening about two weeks ago, I'd say, where I started to see flights out of Chengdu, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing on this upward track again, very, very quickly. The summer lockdowns lasted somewhere around two months, but these lockdowns were like seven to 10 days and they started reopening. And I had posted a, a uh, picture on my Twitter on these five airports specifically that look, we're seeing this, this reopening start to happen. And I'm probably gonna post an update on it tomorrow because I think tomorrow for the first time since February of, of this year, Chinese international flights will be over a thousand flights. Um, I believe it's a thousand flights, yeah. Um, and we see for the first time in, I think since the start of COVID, some of these cities in these five cities go over hurdles and hit sort of uh, uh, post COVID highs, which to me tells me two things. One, activity is wrapping up a lot faster than people projected after this latest lockdown. And B, if China is opening international travel after two and a half years, we saw news come out of Macau that Chinese tourists can go to this casino destination again. That tells you there is a massive demand that's impending from, from three things. One, Chinese domestic travel ramping up, including road travel. Uh, Chinese road travel was up 200,000 barrels week over week last week. I don't see this on, on Reuters. I don't see this on Bloomberg. I don't see this anywhere. Um, the other thing, Chinese tourist travel. You know, have a look around your, your area, go to the tourist areas. You will not see those, those buses of Chinese tourists that you saw pre-COVID. So not only is that demand coming back within China, Chinese tourists make up a huge portion of tourism within Singapore, within Thailand, uh, within Malaysia, within Macau, as I mentioned, uh, within some European countries, uh, even within Canada. Like you look at Banff, you look at some Ontario tourist areas like Niagara Falls, you will see a shift in the demographics of the tourism there. And a lot of that deferred demand is not just like tourists coming back. There's two and a half years of tourism that's going to come back all at once, um, right away. The third thing would be your, your international travel to China due to business and Chinese, uh, not Chinese, but, but people who have family in China who have not visited because of their 14 day hotel quarantine, et cetera, regulations, all that travel is gonna come back. And where is the big jet fuel consumption? It's in international flights. And where do we have some of the best real-time data out there? international flights, domestic flights. That's really all I look at when I look at the Chinese economy. Uh, we can sit here and make all sorts of speculations on uh, this is happening, that's happening. You know, this person got locked down or my friend told me this on the Telegram chat, et cetera, et cetera. It's all really meaningless to my, to my uh, perspective. I think when you wanna be efficiently understand what's going on in, th in these economies, we wanna look at the flight data. And as soon as I see flights, in, in patterns like China to Thailand, China to Australia, China to New York um, pick up, it's game on. I think it's game on because that tells me they're completely done with zero COVID. If they're letting people go to these destinations and then re-enter China, that tells me there's no way they can control things at that point. And, and they're just saying, 
okay, we're done with this. Let's open up. Let's get this economy going. Uh, they will likely back it up with a lot of stimulus. We've already heard this with uh, cell phones, EVs, uh, TVs, uh, and, and some real estate uh, stimulus already on the way. Um, and maybe a lot more of it. They, they don't want to show poor GDP numbers. And again, we can say the GDP is uh, uh, wrong. It's, uh, it's just a random number they pull out, et cetera. But the thing is, all those theories are completely false because we see Chinese oil demand going up every year. So even if you say the GDP is made up, like what are they doing with the oil consumption? It's just going into some random tank somewhere, right? It, it doesn't make sense, all these theories that I've been hearing for the last many, many years that China is collapsing, their uh, real estate is collapsing, their banks are collapsing, while their oil demand keeps going up every year. So something in the economy is working in reality. And um, that I think is the number one factor. If Chinese demand picks up by 2 million barrels a day between today and call it uh, Q1, the end of Q1 of next year, we are gonna be so undersupplied in this market that you would need not just a recession, but a, a, a global absolute depression and a complete collapse of credit markets to get us back into a, a balanced zone, um, especially if Russian oil as winter comes online, uh, it, if Russian oil starts to get affected, this is going to be the bull market of bull markets of commodities. Um, and, and I just don't understand people that are out here shorting oil and they're out here selling equities, selling calls. You're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller that will absolutely crush you. Um, and you know what? That's what makes a market. So that's how things are. Uh, but I'm I'm very, very on the on the bullish side of things where any sort of catalyst here could absolutely blow these these shorts out of the water or people who are not invested um, sitting on the sidelines waiting for like really, really good entry points. Um, this is not investment advice. I'm not an investment advisor. So please uh, do your own due diligence on, on any of this. Um, but I I am, you know, I, I sit here with the price of oil dropped X dollars with my equities down X amount. And uh, I sit here without a worry in the world because I mean, I know what's coming on the other side of this, and it's going to be uh, historic uh, as to what's coming. Yeah, I agree. And it's something that doesn't get brought up very often. I have a couple comments on that because that was a lot of great stuff. Um, is the infrastructure in Russia and, you know, Ukraine and Europe and what happens when some of that gets damaged? It doesn't come back right away. And, you know, what happens when Russia needs to pull some of those workers into their forces? And what happens when, I mean, we've just seen it with Nord Stream 2, that this alleged sabotage on the pipeline, what happens when things like that start happening? You know, Ukraine might decide to fall on their own sword and destroy some of that energy infrastructure just to get to Russia. And, you know, these things can happen. I'm, I'm not predicting that any of this will, but it's certainly a factor to think about. And you mentioned a, re a recession as well. And I follow Eric Nuttall a lot. He He's the Nine Point Energy Fund Manager, and I have money in that fund. So I like to listen to his videos and comments. And one thing that he likes to say often is that in a recession, the oil demand doesn't necessarily go down. It just it just doesn't grow at such a rapid pace as it would have in better times. And I think that's interesting. And that could be due to the emerging markets, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and another thing that he's mentioned, I know he had an analyst on the one video, I forget his name, unfortunately, but he mentioned a, a major threat to oil, in his opinion, would be a physical and paper market separation. So a collapse in the paper market. And this is something that I find interesting, you know, some of the dynamics between the paper and the physical market with oil. And I wonder if I could just, you know, leverage your knowledge on that. How does, how do you see that working moving forward with the paper and the physical? Because it seems like there can be, you know, separation between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic point. And probably one that I, I think about as, as the biggest issue to the bull thesis has been this paper market uh, problem. So uh, just before I get to that, I think uh, it's important that, that viewers realize Russia is the world's third biggest oil producer. In a market that consumes sla slash produces 100 million barrels a day, we, we really price our, our barrels on like the last 500,000 or 100,000 or million that's, that's being sold on the market. Now, what happens? Russia produces 10 million barrels a day. They have shown no restraint 
they they don't care if their gas production has gone down and their gas sales have gone down by 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. So let alone 60 percent. What if what if 20 percent of Russian oil production came off the market? Even if even if nothing went wrong, they just wanted to take it off the market. And uh, it's it's one that I I don't think a lot of people think about. Um, but they've shown no problem with shutting off their own own production um, and and pushing prices higher uh, for gas. So they could they could do the same for oil any moment. Um, but I was digressing. So uh, to the to the paper and physical market comment, I think the the paper markets have taken over. Uh, we've seen very very respected individuals within Russia, within Saudi Arabia, uh, even within the American markets, saying the same thing that look um, the the divergence here is not good, uh, and it's it's not a sign of a healthy market if there's people out here manipulating the physical price of oil based on the paper markets. And, and we see this happening because when you look at the backwardation in the price of oil, you look at one month backwardation, you look at six month or 12 month backwardation. With the price of oil that's gone down here in the last two weeks, the backwardation has actually gone higher, which tells you the physical market is getting tighter and tighter. Why? Because as the price of oil comes down, demand goes up. So naturally, you're going to see more backwardation when we really are in a physically undersupplied market, uh, which is what we're seeing. The other thing uh, is that with what's happened here in the paper markets over the last, call it three to six months, supply has stopped coming online. So if, if we let the physical market really be the barrel and we were in a hundred, 110, $120 range, the SPR never came into the picture. We might've seen more supply being forced online through just picking up random rigs that have been rotting away for five years and, and just brute forcing it uh, back into operation, uh, random fields that have been shut in for 10, 15, 20 years, some work being done to bring those online. But in an $80 environment, it's just not, not interesting enough or not uh, profitable enough to, to do these things or to sanction new projects. So what have you really done? You've made the, the paper market manipulation has made things worse from a physical oil supply demand standpoint going forward. Um, now, coming back to the paper markets, what, what is the issue here? So A, a lot of participants have left the market, whether it's companies hedging barrels, whether it's your institutions and funds that are counterparties to hedging barrels, whether they're buying barrels. It's just, they've just left the market. They said, we have no idea what's happening here. It's too volatile. There's too many chefs in the kitchen. Uh, OPEC, we got Biden, we got producers, we got Russia, we got China. It's too many variables. We we don't understand the markets well enough um, that we're just gonna sit back on the sidelines and just watch, uh, see what happens. The less people that are in the markets, the paper markets, the more volatility there is. So we saw Pierre uh, Anderand mention on his recent interview that he he opened his screen one day and he just saw contracts being dumped on the bid like every minute for hours and hours and hours for days and days. And you kind of start to wonder what like what's happening here and is it politically motivated? Probably. Is there people that have a, a vested interest in reducing the price of oil? Yeah, of course. The whole world wants cheaper oil. Everyone except oil investors want cheaper oil. Um, and, and, and there's not that many of us uh, to begin with. Uh, so there is vested interest from the governments, from the world economies, from the paper markets, a perspective from the banks, et cetera, to lower the price of oil. Uh, to lower the price of energy in general. So I would not be surprised if, if, if there is a lot of contracts being dumped, um, if there is sort of this artificially lowering prices going on. But the thing is, we're not going to know. And it doesn't really matter at this point um, because of one reason that I mentioned a little bit earlier, which was China shutting down. When, when the oil markets are in roughly balanced at times or slightly undersupplied, and I'm talking from a commercial standpoint, commercial inventories being your non-SPR inventories, which are now being manipulated with the release of the SPR is bringing all this barrels into the commercial zone. And like I said, crude is priced on that last 500,000 barrels. And if you're dumping 750,000 from the SPR into commercial, you've all of a sudden taken away that price discovery mechanism that exists in the market. And you're, you're skewing or like putting a cover on real price discovery. 
So that's going to continue as long as SPR releases continue. Um, that part we can't change, but what is going to change, I think, is how undersupplied the market is. If the markets really get into a two to three million barrels per day undersupply uh, with, with Chinese reopening, Russian barrels leaving the market, uh, the general world economy reopening, and then also, I didn't mention this, but gas to oil switching in Europe, uh, these four or five factors, if the markets really get that undersupplied, it doesn't matter how much paper market dumping you do, because if you physically can't find the barrel, people are just going to say this is complete junk. Like you, you sold me a barrel at $80 a barrel. Now that, now that it came time to deliver it, you don't have the barrel. So what do you have to do? You have to go to the physical market and buy a barrel for probably way higher because these are not paper barrels anymore. This is your dated Brent or dated WTI market, which is a physical actual barrel. And you know, you might go to X producer and they and they'll say, Oh, you want a barrel right away in the next two weeks? Uh, we're gonna charge you WTI plus 25. Okay. Well, you have to settle your contract. So you now all of a sudden you lost 20 or $25 a contract. How long can you afford to do this for? Not not very long at all before you go bankrupt. Uh, so I think after the midterms, the American midterms, the pressure does ease off a lot. Um, there is a lot of political pressure, as I mentioned, on the paper markets, um, and the markets have been misled to, to a point uh, while the Chinese demand was artificially lower. So I think these are the factors to watch for. We'll know when the physical market has taken over, um, when we see a lot more volumes in the market um, sort of being, being priced, a lot more volumes being priced at their actual price not some contract price where, where we see these massive volumes on the financial side being sold into the bid day after day after day, because that's just not a normal way that any commodity gets, gets priced um, unless we were oversupplied, which we, we know we aren't because inventories keep drawing. Um, so it's a very opaque market. We, we're not gonna know exactly when it happens, um, but I expect it to be shortly after the American midterms uh, where we see these these prices come back to where they they should be without SPR and without paper market uh, manipulation, which I think today is probably in the in the hundred to hundred twenty dollar range. Um, and and I guess we'll see how it all plays out because if if China again if China really reopens and Russian barrels off the market, that hundred to one twenty, well now you just artificially suppress that price discovery for so long that what ends up on the other side is this is this spike. To some sort of level, um, where where the physical barrel and the paper barrels are back into agreeance of sorts, uh, and and where is that price? I I don't really know, but but we look at um, sort of we we already hit 120 uh, in 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 June, I believe it was, and uh, could we be in a more undersupplied market going into November, December, January? I think it's it's likely. Yes, there there is many many possibilities that we end up in a higher undersupplied market um, then. And uh, I guess we'll see. Other than that, we'll see. We, I surely didn't expect that the paper markets could have controlled the physical markets to this extent that it has. Uh, but I also think the market has not been that undersupplied over the last three to four months, um, in which case it's very easy to skew things uh, from a paper market standpoint when, when you're in that regime. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a good description of what's going on. It's it's just with oil, it's such a global commodity. It's just so many major macro factors going into everything. You know, you've got the war, you've got China, you've got OPEC at max capacity, and you got the SBR and the US election. And it's just a it's it's a wild world. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you before I let you go, this will be the uh, last question. But if somebody was to move into the sector, say into oil and gas, what are what are some of the things and some of the multiples they may want to look for in a company that could be fitting for their investments say you know it's a i know it's a very undervalued sector at the moment so it's it's different than looking at tech stocks for example you kind of have to know what a sort of baseline is when you when you first open up a balance sheet or cash flow statement what what do you look for in oil and gas yeah absolutely fantastic question i think there's there's only two things that really matter at this point uh and some people might disagree with me on this but but the two things that matter is one, your free cash flow yield. So I would say 
before somebody even looks at oil equities, I think the macro and understanding supply demand and having a general direction on where you think oil prices are going, at least a range, it could be a $20, $30 range. It doesn't matter, but, but you need to have some sort of conviction on that first. And once you have that, we look at free cash flow yields. So at the lower end of your range to the higher end of your range, what is the free cash flow percentage this company is making? When we say free cash flow percentage, we mean money made after operating costs, capital costs, in most cases to keep production flat, uh, oil wells do decline. So we need to spend money to keep our production profiles flat. Uh, after taxes, after paying our interest on our debt, after, after everything. I look at free cash flow to EV, to enterprise value. And basically what it's telling you is how much money is the company making as an enterprise value after paying back all these things? And why is that important? Because that money is the money that can come back to you in the, in the form of dividends, share buybacks, acquisitions, debt repayment, um, and just like other mergers and, and land acquisitions, et cetera. So all of these things are a way to return cash to shareholders, which as you mentioned, uh, Eric Nuttall is a big proponent of this, is that companies should be returning more cash to shareholders rather than putting it in the ground. A lot of companies have agreed with his way of doing things. They've come out with these plans saying, okay, we're going to return this amount of cash to shareholders uh, when we hit this debt target, et cetera. And the reason I mentioned debt repayment is because if you pay back X amount of debt, that value has to come back into the share price now of the company to reflect the true value of this company. So all of these are really cash return to shareholder plans. And we look for companies that are trading above 15, 20, 25% in some cases of free cash flow yields. And I mentioned my eight times free cash flow model earlier. That's based on a theory that in as the cycle continues, we should end up at a 12.5% free cash flow yield which means the company trades at eight times free cash flow. 12.5 times eight is, is 100%. That's the value of the company. So why 12.5? Because imagine your company with no debt, you're debt free, and you're trading on the market at, at whatever WTI pricing you picked in your, in your thesis at a 12.5% dividend. The market will likely leave it there or bring it lower. If you came out with a free cash flow yield or, or sorry, a dividend of 20%, most markets that are looking for places to put capital into as they are right now would likely appreciate the share price to a point where your yield gets to 12.5% 12.5% or lower and that's sort of what I, what I look at and one of the things that I've done is on my website the price target spreadsheet it gives you the fair share prices using an 8 times free cash flow model at prices from 70 WTI to 120 WTI and I track about 55 to 60 companies. You can look at all companies, where they end up on the FCF times eight model, where they are today, and what the upside would be at each of those numbers. It's a completely free spreadsheet. Um, so feel free to have a look if you're, if you're interested. And then the second thing I look at is net asset values. So with commodity producers, you have actual physical, whether it's barrels, whether it's tons of coal, whether it's gas, whether it's... Uh, X amount of pounds of nickel or zinc, whatever. You have that physical commodity in the ground. You have a recoverable factor on that. You're not going to recover every single commodity in the ground. You're going to recover some factor of that. And the way it works is you get reserve evaluators who go out and they say, okay, you've drilled this many wells. We know there's oil here. We know there's gas here. We're going to use this, this pricing regime going forward. And your reserves in the ground are worth X dollars. And X dollars divided by your number of shares is this many dollars per share. So we see companies that have 10 year, uh, 10 year reserve lives, as in they can keep their current production going for 10 years. We see companies with 30 year reserve lives. We see companies with 60 year reserve lives. I like to focus on companies that have a lot of reserves in the ground that are unproduced or undeveloped because there's going to come a time in this cycle where some of the major companies want to come back to Canada, they want to come back to the US, they want to invest somewhere. They're looking for pre-prepared reserves. They don't want to explore, they want reserves. And that value of the reserve and the land will slowly leak back into the share price. Um, a lot of funds, banks, institutions, they don't believe in cash flows because they say it's a moment in time. I don't, I don't believe in this, but they will believe reserve values because they're actually getting control of a physical 
amount of oil in the ground or oil that's being produced. Um, and, and they run their valuations more that way. You'll notice this in oil, especially as the cycle matures, a lot of people start talking about uh, net asset values as opposed to free cash flows. So those are the two things I see. A lot of people like to focus on dividend yield, a current dividend yield. They like to focus on management quality. They like to focus on uh, operational expertise, their new wells drilling, their development plans, are they growing production, et cetera. But I think when I run my portfolio, I look at free cash flow yield. I look at net asset value. I pick the top five to seven companies that fit my risk profile within that. And then I go and do deeper dives on them. There's no point doing deeper dive on a company that's only giving you 6% free cash flow yield, right? From, from my investment perspective, the company has to be generating cash flow. It has to have reserves in the ground. And then we can look at, can they actually execute to provide me shareholder value on this as the cycle matures? So those are the things I see uh, from sort of the small, small, mid, large cap perspective uh, out there. There's other companies that do strictly royalties, that do strictly services, uh, but I, I don't focus on those companies. I look at the ENPs, your exploration and production companies. Uh, I think that's where the juice is to be squeezed. You know, companies that actually own assets uh, in the ground and, and are producing them. That's where the, the real value is. And I feel comfortable owning uh, stuff like that in a high inflation environment. Uh, I don't want to be part of other, other sorts of companies that are exposed to, to high inflation, high service, service industry, shortages, supply chain issues, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the easy way. Look at free cash flow yields, look at net asset values, pick your top five, seven, 10, 20 companies, and then we can go and do a deeper dive on those companies. Um, and before we do all that, I think getting a good conviction on the macro is very, very important because as you've seen, this is a very volatile, volatile investment. It goes up and down. And if, you know, if, if you're going to get shaken out because you don't have a strong understanding or conviction on the macro, um, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of people will end up losing money uh, if you will get shaken out on, on the first dip uh, or, or the first drawdown uh, because they, they come fast, they come wild, and they are unexplainable at times with the velocity that they happen. And um, to, to, to back that up, I will say that from the people I talked to recently, I tell more people not to invest in oil than, than I do to, to invest in oil. Um, not because I don't believe the thesis or I don't think they're going to make money. I just don't think they are spending the right amount of time required to understand the macro. Uh, I don't mean general market macro. I mean oil macro. Uh, general market macro is very, very detailed. And uh, it's not something you can just grasp overnight. Uh, nor is oil macro. But at least oil macro is, is a more subsect of that. Um, and, and for those that are interested on that specifically, I run oil and gas macro outlook sessions every quarter. Uh, again, they're completely free. Uh, October 30th is, will be the next one. I have recordings on my website of July 30th and April 30th outlook sessions uh, for those that would like to have a look. They're about four to five hours long because it's a $10 trillion industry. And we would be doing it no justice by talking about it for 15 minutes and pretending we understand uh, what's going on as, as, as sort of you mentioned earlier as well. Yeah. Okay. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Free cash flow, net asset value. Take a look at those and sort of do some deep dives after. And I agree with you. You have to have conviction in what you buy. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to sell out of fear or, you know, whatever, make some poor emotional decisions with your money. So I think, um, this has been amazing. Lots of knowledge there. I'm going to have to listen to this a couple of times myself, to be honest, to try to, you know, digest everything that we talked about today. So I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I want to just say thanks for coming on the show and uh, give you an opportunity. I know you, you mentioned you have your website, but just give you an opportunity to let anybody listening or watching know where they can find you. I know you're on Twitter as well and a few other outlets. Yeah, you betcha. I, I always appreciate talking oil. I, I think it's one that we don't discuss very often, um, whether it's personally or whether uh, with your family and friends or whether in the in the news cycle, we don't, we don't really pay attention to oil, which is the molecule which runs the globe. We look at anything you're wearing, anything you're doing, anything you want to do, traveling, you're, you're going somewhere, the, the world economy, the quality of life that it, it lets people live, it all comes down back to oil and gas currently anyways, and, and, and energy in general. So 
I think it's time we paid more attention to these things, uh, had, had more conversations around where things are going. And, and you know, we don't, we don't want to end up in a place where we're reducing or going back to the old days um, because we just didn't plan these things early enough, right? That's, that's, that would be an embarrassment to the society, to, to human uh, innovation and, and, and human expertise uh, where we are today. So I always appreciate the opportunity. Um, as far as myself, my, my website is whitetundra.ca. I've got all my archived uh, recorded webinars on there. I've got all my recorded um, other, other uh, interviews or other podcasts like this that I do. Um, I also have articles that I write on certain specific companies and on uh, certain parts of the industry as well that are available on there. Uh, my portfolios both are fully, fully public. The White Tundra portfolio as well as my personal portfolio are on the website updated roughly monthly uh, on there. And then all the future events are also on there. As I mentioned, I do these valuation seminars every Sunday uh, right now, along with other, other seminars as, as sort of uh, extras on the side um, as well. My Twitter channel at White Tundra SG and then the YouTube as well, I think, is either under White Tundra SG or White Tundra Investments. If you just Google that, uh, you'll have all the recordings uh, available there. And I'm always available by email as well. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns, any suggestions, uh, info at whitetundra.ca or sgarg at whitetundra.ca. There's a um, mailing thing on, on the website as well where you can type out a message and it, and it sends it to me. So um, yeah, that's about it. I think any other uh, questions, I think on, on Twitter DM as well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty routinely available on there. Uh, so yeah, once again, thanks for having me and uh, thanks to all the listeners. Uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, man. Thanks again. Cheers. Joe is not a financial advisor and may have interest in the stocks discussed on the show. So do not take any information included within this podcast as a recommendation or formal advice. Thank you. Thank you.